In this section, we'll discuss Newton's second law as formulated in Cartesian coordinates. If you recall from section 1.4, Newton's second law is F equals MA. And this is a relationship that tells us how we can relate the force applied to an object to its acceleration. Hopefully you also recall that the acceleration vector is actually the second time derivative of the position vector. In other words, if r is the position of the object of interest, then the acceleration vector is just the second time derivative of that position vector. And so Newton's second law is equivalent to f equals m r vector double dot. Now, we can always write any vector using essentially any coordinate system we like. Uh, one very convenient coordinate system oftentimes is the Cartesian coordinate system. So in that case, we're going to write the force vector and the position vector uh, in x, y, and z coordinates. So let's see what that looks like. So recall the Cartesian coordinate system consists of the x hat, y hat, and z hat basis vectors pointing in three orthogonal directions. And so the way to think about the Cartesian coordinate system is to imagine three different rulers all taped together at one end and held at right angles to one another. And so any point in three-dimensional space can be specified by giving its x, y, and z coordinate. Now, it's not always the case that the Cartesian coordinate system is the easiest or simplest to use in solving a dynamical problem, as we'll discuss later. Um, but you can always apply uh, the Cartesian coordinate system to any dynamical problem. You're always allowed to resolve the problem into Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so here's our Cartesian coordinate system. We imagine we have a position vector, r. It's got a little uh, uh, shadow down on the xy plane that I've shown here with dashed lines our vector. And so um, for Newton's second law, what we're interested in is uh, the second time derivative of the position vector r. The r vector is written as, it can be written in any number of ways, we'll write it here using the x, y, and z hat basis vectors. Okay, so again, remember x, the x uh, component of the position vector times x hat, y, the y component of the r vector, and then a z, the z component. So uh, we need to take two time derivatives of the r vector in order to use Newton's second law. And remember the time derivative of a vector in Cartesian coordinate system uh, is simply the time derivative of each individual uh, coordinate. So that's very convenient, and that's one of the reasons the Cartesian coordinate system is so convenient to use, is because writing the time derivative is actually very simple. There are other coordinate systems where the time derivative is more complicated. The reason that the Cartesian coordinate system is particularly easy to evaluate time derivatives in is because the basis vectors themselves, x hat, y hat, and z hat, they're constant with time, usually. We don't consider them uh, to change with time. So we stick our Cartesian coordinate system down somewhere in space and we leave it there forever. As we'll see, there are other coordinate systems where the, position, the uh, basis vectors will change with time. And so this time derivative can be much more complicated. But in this case, uh, our double dot vector is just this. So we just take the uh, time derivative of each individual component. And so now, we have our force is equal to m times, and now I'm going to write the r double dot vector as a column vector, x double dot, y double dot, and z double dot. Now Newton's second law, written as a vector equation, is really three different equations. So we have 
uh, three different components for the position, sorry, for the acceleration vector on the right-hand side. We also have to have three components for the uh, force vector. And so the force vector we can also resolve into three different components, x hat, y hat, and z hat. And so in reality, when you're writing uh, Newton's second law, you're really writing three you're really writing three equations all at once, and so let's write those on the next page. So let's work through the example problem uh, given 1.6 in the textbook. And so then we're going to write the x component of Newton's second law, the y component, and then the z component. And so this is the beauty of Newton's second law in Cartesian coordinates. The different coordinates uh, separate out very nicely. Now, um, when we're solving a dynamical problem, basically we're trying to solve uh, this set of, of differential equations. Uh, f, f of x, fx is equal to mx double dot. So that's a second order in time differential equation. So usually what we're doing is, uh, when we're solving a dynamical problem, is we're given some... Uh, functional form for the f component of the force, and we have this relationship, then we have to solve for x as a function of t. And the same is true for the other co uh, position coordinates. And so that's basically what we're doing when we're solving a dynamical problem. This is the advantage of the Cartesian coordinate. It breaks these components up. Now each of these individual forces, each of these individual uh, components of the force, might be mutually dependent. So for instance, the f sub z component might itself depend on the x, y, and z positions. So, that, so these force uh, components don't necessarily have to be independent of the other coordinates, but um, they are independent of uh, one another. And so um, that's, that's the basic problem we're trying to solve in classical mechanics is this set of three differential equations for x, y, and z as functions of time. Okay. So here's our classic problem of a block on a ramp. Let's imagine that our block has a mass little m. Uh, the ramp is going to have uh, an angle theta. Um, the block will be subject to a number of forces. So we're going to think here now about our free body diagram. In this case, we'll include uh, friction. So there'll be a frictional force opposing the motion of the block down the ramp, little f. And then of course the uh, block feels a weight, we'll call that little w, and as usual that will be little m times g vector, gravitational acceleration. And then because the block is not falling through the ramp, it's not falling downward through the ramp, there must be a normal force which opposes uh, the, the weight downward at least uh, in the direction perpendicular to the block uh, to the ramp, so there's a normal force here. We'll call that n. Okay. And so that's our basic uh, block sliding down a ramp. Let's apply Newton's second law to work out what the position of the block is as a function of time. And because we're thinking of Cartesian coordinates now, we're going to use it in the Cartesian frame. Okay. Here's our situation again, just smaller. We're going to use a Cartesian coordinate system that's aligned with the surface of the wedge. So here we'll have an x, excuse me, a y coordinate which points perpendicular to the ramp and an x coordinate which points down along the ramp. This is in contrast to maybe a, a, a Cartesian coordinate system which looks like this at the corner of the of the block if we or at the corner of the, the ramp. If we did this, if we use this coordinate system, we'd end up uh, having to use a bunch of cosines and sines. We'll end up having to use sines and cosines anyway, um, but the coordinate system aligned with the ramp is simpler in this case. But it'll still be a, co a Cartesian coordinate system. So we have here our, our Newton's second law. Let's resolve the uh, forces into the x and y components. Fortunately, there's, there's no z component because we're not going to consider motion along the perpendicular direction here. Okay. So our forces along the x direction are what? Well, we've got a force. Um, there's a component of the weight that pulls the block down the ramp. Uh, and then we also have the frictional force, which is opposing the motion of the block down the ramp. Okay, So we've got 
um, the x component of the weight plus the x component of the friction. Those are our x forces. Now for our y forces, we have what? We've got the normal force, the y component of that, and then we've got uh, the, the y component of the weight. Okay, and so these, of course, both have to be equal to their respective m x and m y double dots. Okay, so now let's look at the x components. Um, the component of the weight along the x direction is going to be the mass of the block times its gravitational times either the sine or the cosine uh, of the wedge. Um, you can look at the geometry discussed in the um, example problem and you find that it has to be the sine of the angle theta. And this makes sense. If you think about a wedge um, where the sine of the angle is zero, so now we have a, a wedge that is basically flat along the surface, um, when the sine of the angle theta goes to zero, the x component of the weight should also go to zero. There's no x component of the weight in the case that the block, the ramp is flat. So that's one way to think about why this is a sign. Um, next we consider the frictional force. There is no y component to the frictional force, so frictional, uh, the friction only depends upon along the x direction, so we don't need to worry about f sub x, we just say f. Okay. You may recall from your intro physics classes that the frictional force is going to be related to uh, the coefficient of a friction, in this case kinetic friction, times the normal force. Um, in this case, friction is going to point in the negative x direction, so it's going to point back up along the ramp um, to oppose the motion, so we need a minus sign here. And so now, what, uh, now we see that we need to actually work out what this normal force is, and in order to work out the normal force, and therefore the frictional force, we actually have to work out uh, the components of the forces in the y direction, so let's go look at that next. Okay, so now we have the y forces, and the y forces we need to think about are the weight as it points along y, and the normal force, which only has a y component. Now, the a y component of the weight is going to be the mass of the, the block times g times either the sine or the cosine. We just had the sine for the x component of the weight. That gives you a hint that this probably wants to be the cosine. But you can also think about the fact that if we had a, a ramp uh, that was flat again, so that theta were 0, the weight would only point along the y component. So if theta were 0, all of the weight points along y, none of the weight points along x. And you can see in that case, cosine of, uh, of 0 is 1, and so the y component of the weight would just be mg. Okay, so that's, that's another way to think about whether you need to use the sine or the cosine here. Now the block is going to slide down the ramp, so along positive x. It's not going to jump off the ramp. So in other words, the y component of the block's position is going to be fixed. It's not going to change. Therefore, there have to be no net accelerations along the y direction. No net accelerations. In other words, the forces along the y direction have to be zero in order for y double dot to be zero. If those forces are zero, then that means we can use this expression for the weight to work out what the normal force is. The normal force has to be uh, equal and opposite to the weight in order to balance it out. Okay? And so there's our, our uh, uh, y forces. When you add them up, you get zero, and therefore m y double dot is zero, which implies if we integrate once that m y dot is some constant, whatever the initial velocity is, which in this case is going to be zero. We're not going to launch the block off the ramp, and therefore y, integrating again, 
is just going to be some other constant. And again, uh, the block is going to start on the ramp. We'll assume that on the ramp is y equals 0. And so y is just 0 for all time. But now that we have an expression for our normal force, let's go back and solve for the uh, x position as a function of time. OK, so here's Newton's second law along the x direction. mx double dot is equal to the sum of the forces along the x direction. Uh, we have our, our weight here, the x component of the weight. And then we have our uh, frictional force. Recall that we just worked out that n has to be, the magnitude of n has to be uh, mg cosine theta. And therefore, the frictional force is just mu times that. And so mx double dot is equal to mg sine theta minus mu m g cosine theta. And so what you see here is that the frictional force just reduces the acceleration along the x direction by some amount. If there were no frictional force, say if mu were zero, then we would just have mx double dot is equal to the gravitational acceleration along the x direction. So we just have gravity pulling the block down the ramp. We can divide through by m on both sides and what we get is we can combine some terms on the right hand side over here and what we get is x double dot is just equal to sine theta minus mu cosine theta g. In other words, the acceleration along the x direction is just a little is a little bit smaller uh, than g because this term here is going to work out to be less than one. You can integrate this equation twice with respect to time, and what you find is that x as a function of t is just going to be 1 half g times the sine theta minus mu cosine theta t squared. In other words, we've got uh, motion uh, for, with a constant acceleration, which if you recall from your intro physics class always gives you a t squared term, and so that's the solution. And so just looking through the example uh, in the book a little bit too, just to make sure you understand all the little details here.